Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's March 9th and it's time for my, uh, well, deep space updates by not weekly, but not quite fortnightly, a new segment where we cover what's been going on in space in the last uh, week or so. And yes, obviously, yes, there will be a whole Russian Ukraine thing later, but uh, we're going to start with the launches that have happened in the intervening time since our last episode. So yeah, 28th of February, Rocket Lab, they launched the Strix X uh, beta spacecraft. This la launch was called the Owl's Night Continues. So they previously launched one. This is a synthetic aperture radar satellite uh, for a Japanese company called Synspective. March 1st, a uh, United Launch Alliance uh, set up uh, an Atlas 541 to launch the GOES T satellite. Uh, that is a geostationary weather satellite. Once checked out in orbit, it will become GOES-18. And what will happen is that is going to operate in parallel with GOES-West, which is the current satellite that operates over the Pacific. That has a thermal problem with its camera, which means on the night side of the Earth, its thermal uh, cameras aren't working as well as they should because it's getting too hot. So by the end of the year, they will hopefully replace this and GOES-West will be able to be used as a hot spare if anything else goes wrong. Go, goes wrong. Uh, there is actually a really cool bit of video associated with launch where a classic plane fan got out uh, an F-86 Sabre and had uh, the rocket launching in the background. It looks amazing, although I'm going to say the Sabre with its big intake on the front, it does look like it's trying to scoop up the rocket in. Yeah. Anyway, uh, 3rd of March, there was another Starlink launch from Florida. Uh, yeah, and this booster is another one that's making its 11th flight. So yeah, that's the third booster to join the Nigel Tufnell Club. 5th of March, China launched a Long March uh, 3C from Xichang. Uh, it was a ride share with a total of seven satellites. Six of them are like 5G communication satellites for a company called G uh, Galaxy Space, I think. And uh, there's a Earth observation satellite from a company called Space Wish. And uh, yeah, Iran succeeded in launching a, a rocket with a satellite. This is the Kassed sat rocket with the, the Newer 2, which previously Newer 1 was dismissed as being a webcam on a satellite that was tumbling. Uh, I'm not sure what the status of this one will be, but Frankly, I'm more concerned by the fact that the Kassed is a successful launch vehicle from the sort of more military side of things, you know, the Revolutionary Guard. They have been, uh, they've proven much more, they've got more money, so they've been much more successful than the Seamorg. Um, they, you know, they use uh, these large uh, solid motors on the second stages, which is an important technology uh, that they've obviously been driven to develop. Uh, yeah, and finally, just, you know, it might, it's still in orbit right now, I'm sure. The, the, there's a Starlink launch, again, for, from Florida. And I think this is going to be the last launch of Starlink from Florida for this year that goes to the southern landing site. I think spring is coming, weather in the North Atlantic is getting better. And uh, yeah, we're going to see a return to normal operation for Starlink. And yeah, we'll have to talk more about Starlink in Ukraine because that's an interesting story. But... Uh, Previously, or last week, or last whatever, there, we had this uh, failure of Astra with their LV0008, which, yeah, if you remember, it launched successfully, first stage worked fine, but then there was a problem at stage separation and the upper stage spun out of control. Well, they have already conducted their investigation and they have two problems that they identified with the, this launch. First of all, the fairing the wiring harness that is used to trigger the separation systems two of the wires were swapped and apparently their detection system or their test system detected that all the wires were connected but not that they were connected in the wrong order this might have been a specification problem but ultimately yeah because the things fired out of sequence the fairing didn't release properly and then when the satellite moved up it banged into it and eventually when the engine did fire the fairings popped off but the satellite then spun out of control. Now, the spin out of control is due to a software problem that was resulting in packet loss uh, being delivered to the control system. So, like a lot of spacecraft now, they use like equivalent of Ethernet or you know basically a, 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 a vehicle area network. That's what it is. It's, it's a packet based network to communicate with everything rather than specific lines. And you know, apparently as it spun out of control, there was some contention. 
and they just were dropping data on the floor. So the rocket couldn't gimbal to control itself. And so it's fascinating to see that, I guess, if that hadn't happened, it was hypothetically possible that that you know, second stage could have got itself back under control and continued to orbit, and then everyone would have complained that their satellites were smashed on the inside of the fairing. Uh, yeah, I hope they fix this because it looks like there might be a launch from Astra very soon. There is a TFR uh, near Kodiak, Alaska set up for next week, but Astra haven't officially confirmed that it's for them, but it would be in line with their previous uh, you know, mode of operation. Um, also really big news, by the way, is NASA's budget for last year has finally been approved. So, you know, the, the fiscal year, I think, starts in October or something like that, but Basically because politics is such um, a partisan mess right now, it takes forever to get everyone to agree on anything. And yes, we do finally have a budget for NASA that is probably going to get approved. It's $24 billion. It's another increase from last year. Um, you, we get more money for SLS because Congress loves that. You know that we're getting uh, $1.2 billion for the human landing system with potentially some language that says you have to figure out how this is going to work. A uh, hundred million dollars for commercial LEO development. Not as much money for like science that was as asked, which is unfortunate. But uh, at least we're seeing things moving forward there. I'm hoping they will do this in a more timely manner next time. Who am I kidding? Uh, also in politics, yeah, we got some real insight on the cost of SLS because uh, General Paul Martin, who's in charge of NASA's Office of Inspector General, he was testifying before like some committee and basically revealed that the cost of SLS per launch for the launch vehicle, Orion, and ground support services is going to be $4.1 billion, right? And let's be clear, that is more than NASA paid for all of SpaceX's like cargo launches. It's, it's just, yeah, it's a mind-bogglingly huge figure. And, and like, of course, the committee is full of pro-SLS fans from both parties, right? You know, <laughs> and one of them was really interested. Well, if we launch SLS more, will it make the per launch cost cheaper and easier to justify? And uh, yeah, there was even like a statement by one of the committee members. It's like, I'm concerned that NASA is getting cheaper stuff from commercial companies. We we shouldn't be losing this. Yes, yes, you shouldn't. You should be figuring out how NASA can fund space stuff without giving a blank check to contractors that are then encouraged to just take as long as they like. Um, and yeah, speaking of, of the SpaceX thing, NASA has actually confirmed three more flights for SpaceX uh, as part of the commercial crew program. So that will be uh, yeah, that'll be 10 total flights if you include the Demo 2. Uh, assuming that there are four astronauts on every one of these flights, the total cost of this contract extension is going to be $776 million. That'll be about $65 million per seat, which is a lot. It's probably more than what the commercial astronauts are paying, but it's still a lot less than Roscosmos was charging for Soyuz seats while Dragon wasn't flying. And, and, you know, this was a contract extension that was announced a while ago and it was like nobody expected anyone but SpaceX to get this because the other competitor is Boeing with Starliner, which hasn't even launched. And even if it was working, Boeing hasn't got a launch vehicle for Starliner because there's you know no more Atlas V available. Uh, coming across the Atlantic, uh, well, going across the Atlantic, I guess, um, there was news that Virgin Orbit has signed a deal with a Welsh company uh, called Spaceforge, and they're going to be on the first rocket launch out of a uh, you know, spaceport in the UK. And I say spaceport in the UK. This is you know, this is kind of uh, I'm not so sure about this. Basically, Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit is going to fly Cosmic Girl over there with a rocket on it. They're going to pick up some satellites and they're going to launch and then launch the rocket into space. Is it not easier to just fly the satellites across the Atlantic? Okay, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope that it turns into something more permanent at some point. But yeah, Forge, Space Forge is a company, their whole thing is they want to do in orbit, on orbit manufacturing in microgravity. And their Forge Star satellite, you launch it on a rocket, it does something cool like manufacturing high quality fiber optics in zero G. And then when the time comes, it closes itself up, you know, and then 
lands back on Earth, it gets recovered and reprocessed. That would be an extraordinarily cool if they, thing if they could make it work and make it profitable. Certainly, I'm glad to see research on it. Okay, so now, yes, yes, uh, the, the elephant in the room. Yes, we have, uh, well, Ukraine again has seen a lot of very relevant space stuff going on. First of all, uh, we've seen a sort of emergency deployment of Starlink. Like, so... And it's not quite as emergency as it looked like. What we saw on Twitter was uh, is it Mikhail Fedorov, who is like some Ukrainian digital minister, basically saying, Elon, send Starlink. And uh, Elon's like, yes, we'll do it right now. Truth is, they had been trying to do that for the last couple of months, try to get landing rights in the country because, the, you know, the territory would have to sign off on Starlink working in this territory. Now, I believe that these are going up to satellites and the base stations are in Europe. So that was all working. They just needed to get like formal approval. And like Gwyn Shotwell literally said, well, we saw the tweet and we just considered that to be approval. Uh, now, there's also been some other stuff that's happened because this is, this is basically using a civilian thing in a war zone. It's been susceptible to jamming and apparently SpaceX, maybe they're working on or maybe already have software updates that allow them to evade the jamming to a certain extent, has also said that there's special operating modes going to be available where they can run the antenna in a low power mode so it can run off of like a vehicle power supply and enable roaming, which the rest of the world doesn't get roaming, but apparently if you're in a war zone, you get to drive around with your Starlink antenna and not have it break. Um, but on the other, on the flip side, of course, Elon has stated that he will refuse to block Russian news sources at the request of uh, governments. And by the way, those governments, he points out, aren't Ukraine. Um, what else? Uh, so yeah, OneWeb. There was some question about what was going to happen to OneWeb because they had a bunch of satellites that were getting ready to launch from Kazakhstan on the Soyuz. Well, uh, yeah, Rogoz, Dmitry Rogozin has been making a lot of noise about this and at one point tweeted a video showing the flags on the side of this rocket, vertical, on the pad, getting covered up. So, you know, British flag and everything. Uh, and, you know, then I'm going to say, you know, Rogozin knows a lot about cover-ups. Remember that whole thing about the Soyuz with the hole in it? And, you know, instead of, like, revealing that it was Sergei McDrunken face on the production line, uh, no, he de decided that he was going to blame it on a NASA astronaut. It, 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 it was such a ridiculous thing. And yeah, you know, he's also made comments about broomsticks. I can tell this is like a, uh, what do you call it, a Freudian slip where he just has it in his head. Oh, he's sweeping this under the carpet. Yeah. But yeah, where were we? Yeah, so OneWeb. Yeah, they they took the rocket down eventually. They put like the V and the Z invasion you know, identifier marks on the side of the launch erector and OneWeb are very clearly looking for another place to launch. Like, Dimitri basically said, if you could assure us this will be used for non-military means, we will you know, allow this launch. And I'm going to say that's the same kind of assurance, I guess, that uh, Russia gave when uh, they said their vehicles were not going to invade. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, Rogerson has been such... Ah, oh, he has been such a clown the last few weeks. I mean, like, you got to understand, this guy is a politician. In fact, he's very much on the nationalist right-wing side of things. He was actually banned at one point, I believe, for standing in elections. But that's probably because Putin saw him as a threat or whatever. Maybe not, but whatever. He's not really a scientist. And he's getting into these Twitter fights with, um, well, people that are smarter than him, Let's let's face it. I mean... Scott Kelly being the finest example. Senator Scott Kelly, former NASA astronaut who knows a whole lot more about Russian spacecraft than the head of the Russian Space Agency and can tweet at him in Russian. Yeah, this has been fascinating to watch. And, and the thing about Rogozin really is he's just really interested in political power and all of his stupid play acting stuff on the internet is really for an audience of Vladimir Putin. That's all. He's, he's like, oh, I, I went and I made jokes about these Westerners. And I was like, like, oh dear, it is such a mess. And that guy shouldn't be running a space agency. Uh, <laughs> he, he's, yeah, you, you know that his salary is more than the director of NASA. And yet the average pay of a person at Roscosmos is like one tenth of what someone at NASA typically gets. It's absolutely... 
Yeah, yeah. Oh. What am I going to say? Yeah, he's also banned from a bunch of countries because of you know, various things. Um, so yeah, what what what's so yeah yeah you made some like comment as well. It's like we're not going to send sell engines to anybody else. We're not going to sell engines to America. You could fly on a broomstick. And SpaceX literally in this morning's launch stream they said, oh, there goes our broomstick or something like that. Yeah. But on other side of things, like it's not all the Dimitri, uh, you know, comedy show. It's there's a lot of other stuff happening that is actually relevant to operations on the ground. Ukraine's Max Polyakov, uh, you know, who he he is part of Skyrora or he's a founder of Skyrora, and he was a founder of Firefly, but had to essentially give up his support, uh, give up his his share. He's basically been campaigning to get commercial space imagery companies to deliver services to Ukraine to help, you know, with whatever operations they have on the ground. And, you know, it is interesting now that because there's so many commercial imaging satellites, they may not get the same quality as like a high-end NRO observation spacecraft, but they can deliver observation cadence at a much higher rate. They can give you daily updates on what is going on and where. Some of the um, some of the potential partners may be collaborating. I, as I understand it, any imagery wouldn't necessarily go directly to Ukraine. It would go to like a set of analysts outside the country who would clear and analyze and then pass on the stuff they felt was important and didn't actually compromise uh, other things, right? Because this is still a very delicate situation. I'm, you know, okay, delicate is maybe not the best way to describe Russian operations in Ukraine. But yeah, uh, politically, it's sensitive on many levels, and that's unfortunate. Uh, another satellite provider, Hawkeye 360, they have, they have basically a bunch of satellites in orbit that are doing open or commercial uh, signals intelligence, I guess the best way. They're basically listening to RF and analyzing it, and they have been tracking GPS interference. And that is a that has been a very good indicator of where uh, Russian forces are and what they are doing, and it's it was noted that the in the run up to this uh, invasion, there was a lot of GPS interference in the regions where they were operating. So this is definitely it's it's been a fascinating map showing this all going on. So look, uh, I wish there was better news to report from uh, you know. From Ukraine, uh, I wish that everyone would be nice and happy and yes, go home. <sighs> I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.